In a happy barnyard some years ago, a seemingly unimportant event occurred which was destined to vitally affect the future of that little world. Mr. and Mrs. Duck were expecting. <laughs> We should stay out of it entirely. And all our efforts should be made to keep out of the fight. But you have fight our own battles. They mean nothing to us. We should mind our own business. By all means, no. Yes, fight. No. No. Yes. If my country calls, yes. No. father, who was in World War I, uh, just broke down and cried, just, and I'd never seen him cry like that. And uh, it was a very sad moment. It was uh, a, an unbelievable thing that, that the Japanese would bomb Pearl Harbor, which of course was our property, you know. It was a very difficult time. I'm through. Oh, what I give for a can of spinach now. It was such a scary time. You didn't know whether you were going to be taken over by the Japanese or the Germans, you know. You didn't know whether they'd be coming on our land or what. We had a, a babysitter, a Japanese babysitter, and she told us they were going to be shipped away. She's an American citizen, third generation, said so they were going to be shipped away to camps. I, and that, that I tried hard to, to find out whether it could be stopped. It wasn't. When the war starts, the U.S. is in an, an interesting position because there are so many people from so many different nationalities that it's not completely clear where their sympathies lie. We were named enemy aliens. Even so, we were not enemies. We were, you know, we had left Germany. Nevertheless, our status was enemy alien. We had to be home by nightfall. There was a curfew, I think it was 8 o'clock. We couldn't even get medicine for the children. We had to ask a neighbor. Um, it was very difficult. And. Uh, we were known as Kraut. I mean, nobody called us German, we were Kraut. From the film industry alone, including, of course, writers and cameramen and everybody, there were 1,500 immigrants that had left Hitler. Adolf 
Hitler, the greatest conqueror of all time. He is the... One moment, please! Adolf Hitler, pretty good, all right. Take two million square miles. But gentlemen of Japan, much better. Form greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Knock off over three million square miles. Lots more than Hitler. Soon make better record. Extend horrible empire. Take California, South America, Brooklyn, Europe, take whole world. Yes, he who attacks America shall die. When the war broke out, everybody cheered. In England, when the, war, the first World War broke out, boy, the bells all over the place went, everybody, yeah, boy, we're off to that. And I think a lot of people felt that in the Second World War, a sense of, of exhilaration. Hey, Daffy, Americans don't give up. No, Daffy, Americans don't give up. That's right. And I'm an American. Duck. After Pearl Harbor is bombed in December of 41, there's a vast mobilization that all the film, film business goes through and there is a general turning over of effort towards making films about the war and the animation studios do this fairly quickly uh, in part because it makes a lot of money <laughs> In the Hollywood home of Movie Land's Mickey Mouse, artist Walt Disney orders his famous cartoon characters into battle dress. Your country is at war. Your country needs taxes for guns, taxes for ships, taxes for democracy, taxes to beat the Axis. I'm going taxes to beat the Axis. That's the spirit. Yes, the sooner you get your taxes in, the sooner they'll get to work. For it's your taxes, my taxes, our taxes that run the factories. Taxes to sink the axis. Taxes to keep them playing. Taxes to keep them rolling. Taxes to keep them coming. Taxes to beat to earth the evil destroyer of freedom and peace. This is our fight, the fight for freedom, freedom of speech, of worship, freedom from want and fear. Taxes will keep democracy on the march. visual uh, ability of cartoons to convey messages in a very succinct and very graphic, powerful way was extremely important, and uh, the government was, I think, very aware of this, as were animation directors as well. For these are right and we will fight and never will we cease until we win our victory and everlasting peace. So light up that new Yankee Doodle spirit and forever let it shine and show the world that this Yankee Doodle spirit is ours. in 1943 was 94% of his films were war related 94% I mean he was still producing other uh, civilian cartoons but uh, basically his whole plant was like a military facility we did it before and we can do it again and we will do it again we did it before and we can do it again we got a heck of a job to do but you can bet that we'll see it through we did it before, and we can do it again, and we will do it again. We're one for all, and we're all for one, together, licking before we're done. Millions of voices are ringing, singing as we march along. We did it before, and we can do 
it again, and we will do it again. We'll knock them over and then we'll get the guy in back of them. We did it before, we'll do it again. There is a new spirit in America. That's right. The spirit of a free people, united again in a common cause to stamp tyranny from the earth. That's right. Why Donald? Well, first of all, of the Disney stable of characters, the most irascible, the one that they could take the furthest is Donald. I mean, you can't take the straight man Mickey. I mean, come on. Mickey's the icon of, the, uh, of Walt Disney, so he's got to be straight. <laughs> Bugs Bunny, when he, uh, during the war effort, during those war films, was when he rose in popularity, popularity to his greatest point, and he surpassed Disney for the first time. See, from the early years when they first started, my father started in 1931, they were always looking up to Disney. Disney was always ahead of them. We were the clowns. We were, we thought of ourselves as making pictures, um, as making what we, over here, we'd call it Model T Fords which was the basic the Volkswagen of America, and the Disney were making Rolls Royces. I mean, it never occurred to us we were in the same business. In terms of the effects that the, the two styles, the Disney style had on the Warner Brothers style, um, my father had told me a story one time where they saw a Disney short in front of one of the features, and there was a moment in it where Mickey turned to the audience and said, is there a doctor in the house? And that's a really bad Mickey Mouse impersonation. But the shock that, that it had on them when they saw, wait a second, we can break the fourth wall. Is there an insurance salesman in the house? We can actually talk directly to the audience was something that became a real staple in Warner Brother cartoons after that. And I don't think Walt ever really understood the implication of what they created but what later the Warner Brothers directors really made great use of. Mm. Uh, humor to me is subtle, it's small. It's a difference between an eye, an eye flick. If I'm gonna do, if Bugs is gonna do something, I want the audience to know about it. I do a little eye flick over like that, then he knows he's gonna do something. Gosh, ain't I a stinker? Warner Brothers cartoons picked up an incredible amount of speed. Uh, Frank Capra told uh, Bob Clamp at the famous uh, Warner Brothers cartoon director that Anything speeded up was, was funnier. They kept working hard and, and trying to make as funny cartoons as they could. When the war hit and this style of humor that they had created, of the more aggressive, wilder style of humor, was so perfectly in tune with what the audience wanted during the war. They would have Signings, for instance, he, he told me that uh, he used to go to the Broadway stores and have signings of, of pictures of Bugs Bunny and as one of the creators of Bugs Bunny signing it off. Um, Bugs's image did appear on the war planes um, for the war effort and so forth. And in addition, the film Any Bonds Today, which was a very important uh, film in terms of raising money for the war effort, was a film that my father directed early on in the war effort that was the most widely distributed uh, film ever at Warner Brothers. Come on and get him, folks. Come on, skip right up and get him. Any bonds today, bonds of freedom, that's what I'm selling. Any bonds today, scrape up the most you can. Here comes the freedom man, asking you to buy your share of freedom today. Many stamps today, give kiddies, we'll be blessed, we all invest in the USA. Sammy, my, my Uncle Sammy. Here comes the freedom man. He can't make tomorrow's plan. Not, Not unless, unless you buy a share of freedom today. Any stamps, any bonds today. The war bond is uh, an audience will pay a few dollars for a bond. That money will then go towards the war effort. And then in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, they will be paid back with interest on the initial investment on the bond. Look a hook. He's got another bond. 
Well, well, thrifty Throckmorton. Waste not, want not. Okay, you can laugh, fellas, but I got post-war plans. <laughs> <laughs> this was a time when America went to the movies religiously. Um, you went to the movies sometimes two or three times a week. If you saw a patriotic cartoon that had uh, Hitler being mocked or uh, the Japanese being shown in a unflattering way, uh, it reinforced the thing that we were at war and we have to do our best uh, for the war effort. We're in to win, so let's begin to do the job with junk. We're in to win, turn in your chin and listen to it punk. To our nation's call, every rubber ball goes to conquer freedom fall. Freedom fall. Freedom to fall. What? Freedom to fall. We're in to win, our path is in, so to victory, let's go. There is no escaping the war in cartoons. And one thing we tend to lose sight of now is that cartoons in 1941 or 42 were seen by everyone and not just by kids. The ghettoization of cartoons as children's entertainment didn't take place in the U.S. until the 50s when cartoons moved to TV. We never made pictures for children and we never made them for adults. We came to the conclusion that I think every, every person who was drawing, painting, whatever you're doing, must come to, you have to do it for yourself. One thing that's kind of unfortunate now here in the United States is many of the network broadcasts of the original cartoons are now censoring them and cutting some of the gags out. Gags such as suicide gags, when a character says, now I've seen everything, and boom, and blow their head off. They're cutting those things out, uh, and, and by that, people aren't really seeing how outrageous they were and to what level of humor, adult humor, that they had. But they really were directed at adults. During the 30s, there are a number of concerns about what can be represented in films. For instance, nudity is absolutely not allowed after 1933 or 34. Lascivious dancing is not allowed. Intimate kissing is not allowed. Any character who might seem gay must be taken out of the screen. Gosh, I didn't know you cared. Woo woo. So most of the concerns are with issues of sex and violence, and the concerns about violence are also extreme. You can't have uh, limbs blowing off. You can't have uh, things blowing up in people's faces. <laughs> Does your face fear of different territory? One of the silliest things I cut out were cows have udders. Everybody knows that. But all of a sudden, you couldn't show cow udders. That was offensive because they're, I guess, they're nipples. And, you know, you know that's, that's terrible. You can't show children cow udders. Uh, so cows had to wear dresses. And they were serious. I mean, you, you can laugh about it now, but they made cows wear dresses. So the interest of the censors is largely in sex and violence and in the representations of both, often around things that seem rather silly now. I thought I tore a putty tap. I did. I tore a putty tap. Censors contacted Bob and said, that bird looks naked. You're going to have to do something. 
And Bob said he didn't want to put pants on Tweety. That didn't seem quite right. So he made him a little yellow bird in the nest. They often showed uh, in early cartoons a gust of wind blowing up a dress. And that had to go. You couldn't show undergarments. You couldn't show brassieres. Even a brassiere hanging on a clothesline all of a sudden was forbidden. <laughs> I bet plenty of you men wear one of these. In many occasions, my father would add special gags that he didn't think could ever get in, uh, that he didn't ever think could get in, specifically so he could get other gags in that might be on the cusp of getting tossed out for censorship reasons. And sometimes those gags actually did get in the films. Um, and in fact, he told me that there was some techniques he used to use to try, and, and the other directors did as well, to try to sidestep censorship. One was that at special moments, and they knew exactly where it would be in the cartoon, just when that gag was going to come up, they would disturb the, the censor with, do you have a light, or something like that. And sometimes they could get it through that way as well. One of the things about the private snafu cartoons is that they did have some delightful sexual content. Uh, because they were free of the Hayes office censorship, women could have figures. And, you know, if you were a GI stationed somewhere in, uh, on the front, seeing even an animated drawing of, of breasts was exciting. <laughs> Private Snafu was a cartoon character. I assume it came from a comic strip a panel in, in a military magazine. And it was, it was a common military uh, word. Snafu means situation normal, all fucked up. So in some ways, the Private Snafu cartoon could feed into the soldier's discontent. That is, no one wanted to be there. And Snafu's name itself would signify the problem in the army, the bureaucracy, just the way that everything was always going wrong. So I have a feeling that Snafu was seen as the everyman, even though he was dumb, lazy, and physically um, not like anyone you've ever seen. I have a feeling he was both someone you could laugh at and someone who you could in some ways identify with. Manning the far-flung outposts of our global battlefronts, Fully aware of the importance of their individual responsibilities, the sentinels of our outermost frontiers stand their lonely vigils with quiet courage and cheerful devotion to duty. 249 days in this godforsaken hole. 249 days! HQ to NIX. HQ to NIX. Your 249th request for transfer is herewith denied. That is all. Yeah, Philly. Everybody gets to get into the scrap but me. The snafu films were made primarily so that the, the men that were in the war would know about booby traps, maybe, or whatever it was that the, they wanted them to learn about. <laughs>
they felt that by seeing it in cartoons, they would, they would, it would stay with them. And so they were very carefully produced for that reason, that whatever it was that the government wanted to put over it would be in a cartoon, be funny, and, and the fellows, when they saw it, would remember. <laughs> You know, I ain't had a good smoke in years. Hiya, toots. What cooks? You see a boring educational film about um, keeping your gun clean, it's probably going to put you to sleep. But if you see Private Snafu uh, showing what happens if your gun isn't clean or you don't recognize a booby trap when you see one then, and you're going to be blown to bits, then uh, you may pay attention and maybe the message will come across a lot clearer. I wonder, could this be one of them there booby traps? Mm, could be. These cartoons, as opposed to many of the other propaganda films that the soldiers had to see, tended to treat the men like grown-ups. That is, they could have interest in sex, they could have interest in swearing, and it wasn't a terrible thing to hear and see those things on, on film. I suppose some of you are wondering what I'm doing here. Well, you see, uh, some of you fellows have written to me and requested a real good pinup picture of me in nothing but a bathing suit. So, here I am. Oh, I, I have a lot of other bathing suits at home, but the photographer told me you would like this one the best. Because I'm a pin-up girl, that's what they name me. I'm the kid who loves you all. Don't be shy, come on and frame me. Stick me in your locker or against the wall. Pin-up girl, you've all embraced me. I'm your dream, your gay mirage. Many eyes have sweetly faced me. I yours for tax or pins or mucilage at night while you count sheep i'm watching o'er your bed from above and while you're fast asleep baby i know what you're dreaming of your pen of girl my clothes are daring they're not But I swear, I'll go on wearing less and less for my pin-up dress. If it will bring you happiness, all my charms for you unfurl. I'm your little pin-up girl. We made this picture. Which, uh, in which Staff Fu had come back from overseas. And he was with his girl in the theater, and the, the newsreel was uh, on up there. And it said, this, uh, it said something about this. New, our new secret weapon did this to the Jap Japs. What hit you, Tojo? We sent the film off, and uh, the next time I heard about it was uh, the girl down at the end of the empire of the hall where you entered the building. Uh, said, There's a couple of gentlemen here that would like to see you. So we heard the rum 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 down the hall came came some military police, these white things, you know, in the white helmets and full treatment. And uh, and then there were four guys there, and I swear to God, they were all wearing Homburgs and over and, and trench coats. And they came up and they walked into the room there and they started to, they, but they see the pro their problem was 
they couldn't tell I mean, that there was such a thing an atomic bomb. And I don't think any of them knew it except one guy. They knew I'd done something subversive, but they didn't know what the subversion was. And they knew and if they mentioned bomb, then, then they would be revealing a secret. I know what did it, what made the big hole. A new flying bazooka with radar control. They would ask me things like, do you like, um, do you like girls better than, than peanut butter? <laughs> How do you feel about barbed wire, you know, and stuff like that? Have you ever made love to a tennis shoe? <laughs> that kind of things, real brilliant stuff. And uh, when they were trying to find out whether we knew about the, that there was an atomic bomb. You see, I know all about it. I was right there. I seen it with my own eyes. The propelling charge is attached to the tail ciphers, and the booster adapter activates the bomb rig, which sets off the fuse in the trail fence. Therefore, giving the bore a casual stroke pending on the setting of the carburetion, which is time with the ADHD spot plugs, which in time kind of sets. We didn't even know what they were talking about, because they, if they taught us what they're talking about, they would reveal a secret to us. There was an atomic bomb. And when you think about it, probably one man, only one man there even remotely knew what the hell they were talking about. So, you know, it gets, it gets into the really the, the theater of the absurd when you get into that. So I didn't know, but I, but I, I do know they took the thing out. And they wouldn't let the soldiers see it. The, the main thing was they wanted to educate the troops and educate them in as entertaining a way as they could. That was really what was most important. So it was just, it was this very strict approval process, but again, they weren't as concerned with, with whether it was outrageous or, as much as whether it was accurate and whether what they were teaching the troops was true. Due to these rapidly changing weather conditions, the GI is constantly faced with a problem of what to wear. Here, a soldier sets out on an important mission. They would present us with the problem they had, and then we would find a way of humorously having fun with it, and, but also making it very clear. The only vegetation on the island is the tall grass covering the marshy tundra. There are no trees. You're telling me. Another factor that complicates life here is the thick, gummy mud peculiar to this region. I don't mind the mud, but George hates it. Claude don't like it neither. My favorite private snafu is probably spies. And it's one of the early private snafus, and it has to do with spies being all over the place. And someone in the army cannot possibly breathe a word of anything, say a word about anything, mention where he might be being shipped to, because there are certainly spies in the bar. There are spies at the magazine stand. There are spies all over the place. Hello, Ma. I got a secret. I can only drop a tip. Don't breathe a word to no one, but I'm going on a trip. <laughs> Don't plead a bird to no one, but he's going on a trip. Hey, give me some magazines to read for when I'm on the ship. Don't plead a bird to no one, but he's going to go by ship. It's a cinch secret if a fella just takes care. He's sailing on a tube ship. Now we got to find out where. Some of the most dangerous spies will be the women that the soldiers are trying to pick up or date and they are instantly wiring messages back to the Nazis about where a ship might be going. It's been a wonderful evening, and I'd like to stay some more. But I gotta get a move on now. I sail at half past four. He's gotta get a move on now. He sails at half past four. Hey, the troop ship bound for Africa pulls out at half past four. Calling all bull back. The interesting thing about these early snafus, and especially spies, is that they're written by Theodore Gazelle, who's better known to the generations after the war as Dr. Seuss, probably the most prominent and most important, and one of the best of the children's storybook writers. So the films themselves are written in a wonderful kind of a sing-song, rhyming kind of a way. Now the military secret that I carry in my brain, I keep in safe deposit with a padlock and chain. You bet I got a secret. Oh, and I bet we find it out. 
This soul's just got a secret, but I bet we find it out. The war definitely changed the way animators drew people. Uh, they knew how to draw, draw them in an attractive manner, and they could draw them as ugly as possible. And it was very deliberate that, uh, from interviews that I've had with it, animators from the past, that they deliberately drew the enemy in an ugly manner. When these cartoons were made, we knew that we were offending people. We were deliberately making ugly caricatures, and uh, that was part of the purpose of these uh, films, was to laugh at the enemy and to make ourselves feel better. It now give honorable Japanese announcer great pleasure to present Tokyo Rose. The Japanese tend to be shown as very small, buck teeth, glasses, uh, almost as insect-like, certainly not human and not super human in the sense of the Germans. So we have the Japanese almost becoming a subspecies here. This happy gentleman are navigating a human torpedo. Very, very dangerous stuff. But he are not caring. Are you happy gentlemen? You are courageous like Dickens. Happy gentlemen, have you anything to say? Uh, no, uh, nothing except, RIP ME OUT OF HERE! Well, one of the terms they used to tell the difference between, a, verbally tell the difference between the Japanese and the Chinese <clears throat> when they spoke was uh, to have them say flying fortress. And the Japanese would say flying, I mean the Chinese would say flying floatless, and the Japanese would say frying fortress. And. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was useful. Oh, for, oh, to demonstrate how to constructing a delicious Japanese club sandwich. Slice a bread ration card, so. Place a piece of a meat ration card, so. Then eat them. Oh, yum, yum, a sandwich. Mmm. After eating, you were enjoying a club. Poking fun at Hitler was part of the American theater at the time that World War II occurred. And whether it was poking fun of him in a sense like hitting him in, with a tomato, or poking fun of the whole concept of him being a heroic or an epic character. studios, well, Snafu's Warner Brothers, uh, were involved in either in a topical sense or in a production sense for the military war efforts. And this is from a Gandy Goose cartoon, which I can't recall, frankly. But what's interesting is you can see that Hitler's characterized as a pig and Mussolini is characterized as a monkey. When the Fuhrer says, me is the master race, me higher, higher, right in the Fuhrer space, not to love the Fuhrer is a great disgrace, so be higher, higher, right in the Fuhrer space. When Herr Goebbels says, me own the world in space, be higher, higher, right in Herr Goebbels space, when Herr Goering says, he'll never find this place, be higher, higher, right in Herr Goering space, are we not the Superman, Aryan pure Superman? Yeah, be it the Superman, super duper Superman. And it's an interesting song because it became a huge smash hit, too. Uh, it was a Spike Jones uh, song, and it sold by the millions, which also shows you how propaganda was taking place in the music business, too. And this is a way of making the Germans seem like uh, fools, too. And it was a release for people, because they were so worried and so upset about what was happening in the world 
that to go and see a cartoon and have a laugh was a release, and it was very important for people. May I present you with this little token of our esteem? For me? Danke schön, danke schön. Oh, uh, just a little going away present. Well, see you around. Yokohama for my red, white, and blue, my country and you. Goodbye, Mama. I'm off to Yokohama just to teach all those Japs. The Yanks are no sap. A million fighting sons of Uncle Sam, if you please. We'll soon have all those Japs right down on their Japanese. So goodbye, Mama. I'm off to Yokohama for my country, my flag, and you. there's something that's first on my list. Now I'll show you the back. Next comes the girlfriend. Hello, honey. It's Hook. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Don't just stand there, honey. Hang up the phone. <laughs> Choo Choo, will you marry me? After the war, the World War II propaganda cartoon was simply put on the shelf. Uh, we don't see them today because uh, they're embarrassing. Uh, you know, the Japanese are our trading partner, they're our friends. Uh, we no longer can show them the way we showed them during World War II. Probably the major reason is they don't want to convey any kind of racial stereotyping. They don't want anything with anti-Japanese humor. They don't want anti-Hitler jokes, anything like that in their cartoons. And, and these wartime cartoons tend to have some of that stereotyping in them. People are very, very concerned about that now. It's, it's, there's such a great concern where they're willing to sacrifice us learning and understanding about history to be politically correct. They're afraid that in showing uh, the German films of, or about Germany or connoting Germany in a negative way uh, will affect their capability to merchandise and market to that public. And, uh, and there's no question that's the reason. <laughs> from a distance. The average person was not involved. You can't get emotionally involved from that distance. I mean, you allowed your superficial emotions. I don't want the good guys to win, you know. And I'll do certain things to see that they, they win. I'll put out money and stuff like that. But that's not the same at all. You're not involved. And the cartoonists were no different. Uh, when we did things like Trigger Joe and some of those things about bombing uh, and so on, where they th th those were done academically you know you want you you want to do what's right but it's difficult to really understand what right means Johnny 
comes marching home again. Hooray, hooray. We'll give him a hearty welcome then. Hooray, hooray. All the men will cheer and the boys will shout. The gals dress up and they'll all turn out. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. 